Okay, a couple of quick uh, announcements. Uh, there are activities on Monday and Tuesday morning. So on Monday, uh, the party will, will speak on uh, salt on gas at nine o'clock. And I presume it's going to be a hit. So I guess. And on Tuesday, we have um, Christoph Melchior from where is he from? Okay. Uh, right. This is part of the Kyoto podcast. Um, and uh, that also will be at nine o'clock. And you said something about the fact that they're going to cater it. So, breakfast food. Oh, okay. sure he's all that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so our, our speaker this afternoon is uh, David Ketchison, who uh, graduated from the University of Washington, which was say more than 10 years ago, and uh, immediately moved to CAPS, the King Adam University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, um, and has since been promoted to full professor. And we will uh, hear about dispersive wave technique. First of all, thank you, Michael. And uh, it's fun to thank all the organizers and the institute. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. So it's fun. Uh, and a little bit more about myself. So uh, my background really is in first order hydrophone systems and in numerical systems. Uh, and dispersive waves are something I've done a little bit on the side. Right? Uh, and part of why I wanted to come here was to want to connect with this community and hopefully you know, learn from you guys. Uh, maybe also get you interested in uh, things that I've been doing, which are sort of bridging between shock waves and solid waves. Uh, yeah, so my talk will focus um, very much on sort of phenomenological, you know, uh, like the nature of solutions and not so much on um, technical tools, that, you know, or techniques. Um, because those things could be thoughts in and of themselves. And I want to go over, you know, um, things from half a dozen papers in the last 10 years. So uh, it'll be fairly high level. But please ask questions as I go along, because again, I'll cover a lot of different topics. And so better to, I'd much rather have an interesting conversation and not get through everything uh, than get to the end and not remember the question. Okay. So, so. Uh, so, uh, two people that have worked on a lot of the stuff that I'll uh, show you with me are Brandon Rivet, who actually was my advisor at the University of Washington, although all of this was collaborations uh, after I, I left there, um, and Manuel Quesada de Luna, who was uh, my student and then later a research scientist. Okay, so first I'm just going to review a little bit about the behavior of hyperbolic systems. Um, I think this will be familiar to everyone here, but I want to you know, contrast what like, everything that comes later in the talk with this typical behavior. Uh, and I'm gonna start with this nonlinear elasticity system. So epsilon here is strain, V is velocity, rho is density, sigma is stress, and K is something like the stiffness or bulk modulus of the material, right? Uh, this is a pretty generic, um, nonlinear wave equation. Um, in other variables, this is referred to as the P system of Lagrangian gas dynamics. Okay. Uh, this is the equation of state I'm going to use. Right. Uh, this in, in the, in the uh, simulations I'll show you. Right. This is what we use. But nothing is what I'll show you depends on this any nonlinear function. Uh, and since I'm so usually for my audience, this goes without saying but uh, maybe not here, so I should say, thinking of this as the vanishing viscosity limit of some you know, parabolic uh, system, right? This is the, the, the typical assumption when you have some sort of flux. It's not, I'm not thinking of some dispersive regularization, but this is regularization. Right. Maybe it rule is yes. constant. Uh, in, for the moment, yes. In most of the talk, it will be variable, right? But for the moment, the rho and, and k are both constant, right? Uh, and so the behavior of this, it, you know, basically behaves like um, 
what we call Berger's equation. I've heard it called something else the last couple of weeks. Uh, sorry, the Hopf equation, right? And so, uh, yeah, even Euler equation, something different in the regional objects than this one. Uh, okay, so uh, behavior is very simple, right? Um, any any non-trivial initial data forms shocks and rarities in finite time, right? Uh, and one of the consequences of that is irreversibility, right? So after uh, the formation of singularities, we have to define uh, what a solution is, right? Um, using what we call ranking linear conditions for these shocks. And let me play this back after I tell you what, what's going on. So the first half of this animation is the same one that I just showed you. And then at the midpoint of the animation, uh, the velocity, which is the lower plot, will be uh, multiplied by minus one. Flip sign. Okay, and so then the black line is continuing to simulate forward in time with the velocity they gave it. So that means the waves will go back the way they came, right? And the blue dots are just the first half of the simulation being played first. Okay. Uh, and of course, if this was, um, if the solution were smooth, right, then the, the two curves would match up at the end, right? But because of the formation of shocks, right, information has been lost. And this is uh, no longer happening. Okay, uh, another way we can look at it is the entropy. Of course, entropy is the term we use in hyperbolic systems. Uh, for this system, the most natural entropy is just the energy, right? So this is just kinetic and potential energy. Okay, and this, of course, is constant as long as the solution remains smooth. But because we have a you know viscous regularization, uh, then this decays right, um, when there are shocks. It's not yeah, so this blue curve here is the entropy over time, and if you watch closely, then exactly when these shocks form, right? It, it, uh, we can see. Okay, and if you read a textbook on uh, nonlinear uh, first order systems, they'll say something like this always, right? But in one D, at least if you have non-trivial initial data, then what you get are these so-called N waves, right? You have a shock wave and then a rarefaction behind it. Right? And eventually, this thing has two cases. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, waves in periodic media. And really, I want to talk about nonlinear waves, but let me first um, take a detour to linear waves in periodic media. So now, uh, Antonio, uh, rho is going to depend on x, right? Uh, uh, k also. And you'll notice now my stress strain relationship is just linear. Right, so this is just the second order wave equation with uh, coefficients that depend on x. Uh, and two key quantities, of course, are the sound speed and the impedance. The impedance will govern, govern the strength of reflections if we have an interface between two materials. Okay, and if we think about um, paths of information in the xt plane, right? Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to think about um, a medium that consists of alternating layers of two different materials, represented here by the red. Right? Uh, and when uh, a wave reaches the interface between these two materials, right, part of it will be transmitted, part of it will be reflected. And I've drawn some of the sort of characteristic paths that information might take um, in the XT plane here. Of course, there's many more that I haven't drawn. Uh, and the solution will be quite complicated. Right? Um, the strength of the reflections will depend on the ratio of these impedances, but most of the energy, right, for long waves and waves will propagate uh, at a velocity given by uh, something that looks like the sound speed, but here k sub h is the harmonic average of k in the two materials, and rho sub m is the arithmetic average of rho in the two materials. And this generalizes to uh, you know, other situations where this isn't necessarily piecewise constant. Right? Most of the energy will move at this speed. And typically, this speed is going to be slower than the sound speed in either medium, right? which makes sense because sometimes information is traveling to the left. So. Uh, OK, and we can um, use perturbation theory, right? homogenize this medium, right? come up with an effective uh, uh, medium, and, and uh, to lowest order, we get this hyperbolic system, and you can see immediately that it's just a wave equation with this sound speed. Okay. 
Let's remember, though, because this will become important later, that some of the energy is being transmitted much more rapidly than that effect of sound speed. Right? And the fastest rate at which uh, a signal can travel through this medium right, is given by this path that, that is never reflected. Right? And the speed uh, at which that moves through the medium is just this harmonic average of the two sound speeds. It will be typically much, much larger than the speed at which most of the information. Okay, and here's just a visualization of that. So uh, I'm showing you simulations in two different media imposed on each other. Right? So the black wave is traveling in a homogeneous medium. So this is just the wave equation, and the sound speed is one everywhere. So it's moving at velocity one. Okay? The blue is moving in a medium that is composed of these alternating layers, hundreds of them. Right? where the sound speed in both layers is equal to one, but the impedances are different. And so there's all kinds of reflection going on, and this effective sound speed, you can see, is significantly slower. What you also see is this development of a dispersive tail. Uh, and that's the most important effect, actually, for what I'm going to talk about, is that for longer wavelength waves, one effect of this periodic variation of the coefficients is to uh, generate at the macroscopic level dispersion. But I'm not, I'm not solving a dispersive wave equation here, I'm solving just for sort of wave equation. Very so you've got a solid uh, blue epsilon in the strain. Is that, should we read that as very high frequency? Yeah, sorry, the, the line is a little bit too thick and because of the like um, conversion to the, to the video, it's a little bit hard to see, but it's actually discontinuous, right? Uh, the strain is discontinuous. And the stress is continuous right, at the material interfaces. Uh, I'll show some some plots a little bit later that will make it clear or be able to see it better. Okay. Sorry, that's not very clear on here. Okay, and uh, we can use perturbation theory and go further, right? I said at the lowest order, you just get this first order system, right? If you keep going, of course, you get infinitely many terms here with increasingly high order derivatives, right? Um, so you can derive basically this infinite order PDE, but with constant coefficients, the solutions approximate the solutions of the variable coefficient system. Um, and the first term that you get looks like this. Okay, so it, it turns out to be dispersive. Okay? Uh, and the coefficient, you'll notice, um, depends on the difference between the impedances. Right? In particular, if the impedances are equal, then this term vanishes. And in fact, if they're equal, then all of the terms, the infinite many terms that you'll come up with here, uh, will vanish because in that case there's no reflection. All that happens is your wave moves faster and slower depending on which part. See, okay. all the interesting things happen. Then these two things are. Uh, this was worked out all the way back uh, in a nice paper in three by Santos and Sons, um, and yeah, actually in, in three dimensions. What happens? You have linear waves and periodic. And in general, so th this is the coefficient that you get for this piece by this constant medium. In general, uh, the coefficients of the terms that appear here will be uh, some kind of averages of the, the coefficients in the original equation. Uh, in multi dimensions, you can do the same thing, and the coefficients that appear here will be the solution of uh, an elliptic bound problem. So let me come now. Any questions before I go on? Okay. So we're going to put these two things together, right? Nonlinearity uh, and effective dispersion um, from, uh, from from this variation of coefficients. Okay. And everyone here knows what happens when you get nonlinear terms together. Uh, okay. So here's my uh, equation that I'm going to focus on now. So we've got the spatial variation. Uh, of the coefficients, and we have a nonlinear stress strain. And I'm going to have you know some arbitrary pulse moving through uh, this piecewise constant medium. Yeah. Uh, so here's just a visualization right, to give you an idea of the scale of the medium. Okay. I'm showing up here the stress and here the velocity, right, which are both continuous. Uh, and the critical parameter that governs how much dispersion there is in the system right, is this ratio. Of the, the two okay. So I actually just started here with a half cosine pulse, but it's already seen that the animation starts. Okay, and you can see uh, we get sort of an incoherent mess. Um, 
It's not time reversible, right? So here I'm playing the, the same thing that I did before. Halfway through the animation, I'm going to flip the sign of the velocity, right? And then continue solving forward. And the blue dots are the first half of the animation in reverse. Uh, and what we see is that you know they don't match up, right? It's not reverse. Uh, yeah. David? Yes. Um, you had to comment again, but what's the numerical scheme? Yeah, I'm not actually going to say anything about numerical numbers, but I'm happy to talk to people about it because that's a lot of the work that I actually do. Okay. But uh, you're confident. So, in the work you're so everything you see here is uh, is actually quite over resolved, right? Uh, the, the plots would not look any different, you know, if, if I were showing you the exact solution, but for reminds me that I can see about all the, the plots that you see. Um, well, except for one simulation. But the relations we yeah. learn for doing for full system periodic, right? Not in the average. That's right. So, so, yeah. so in all of these simulations, unless I say otherwise, I'm solving the first order hyperbolic system where we're using dot not that methods with Riemann solvers and integrals, right? Um, yeah. So this is just another view of the same simulation, and the point is that the entropy decays, right? It's constant for for a short time, and then. Shocks form. It's a little bit hard to tell here, right? Is there really a shock here? Is it just a steep gradient, right? So this is a way to try to get at that. Of course, the the way this is dissipated will depend on your numerical scheme. Um, but uh, again, this is very you know, It's a really good question. I, I'm not going to spend more time on the talk, but if you have specific questions about it. Yeah, the formation of shock on inside one period and then it just yeah, this is a good question, right? and I'm happy to come back to it, right? Obviously, yeah, if you start with a steep gradient and you have, you know, a, a, a large homogeneous region of medium, then you will get shocks. Um, but here, you can see, right? But you do or you do not get shocks? So here, there's definitely shocks. Ah, okay. right? Yeah, that's why we, we don't see, why we see that it's not reversible and that there's entropy decay. Uh, okay, here we've increased the ratio of the impedances, right? So you can think about it this way when this ratio is one, right, the, the solution will behave just like in a homogeneous medium, essentially, right? and we'll have strong shock form, right? Uh, so the further away, the further this gets from one, the stronger uh, this effective dispersion becomes. Uh, and now we get. Train of solitary waves. Although these solitary waves have a periodic modulation in space because of their phase relative to the medium. Right? But if you look at them right after they've moved one period through the medium, their shape is constant. Or if you look at them at a single point in, in space as they move through in time, right, that, that shape is constant. Uh, so this all, all this work that I've been talking about so far uh, was done by uh, Daryl Young and Randy Beck. Carol was a student a few years before me. Um, and so they, they looked at these things in the strain variables. Right? So in, in the strain, these things have this discontinuity, and they said, oh, it looks like a stegosaurus dinosaur, right? Uh, and it's a solitary wave, so let's call it a stegosaurus. So. <laughs> Uh, and essentially, any you know arbitrary initial pump that you start with right, will evolve into a How important yeah. is it to have a system for the scale? Uh, not important, but well, okay, it depends on what you mean, right? So obviously, having a system is absolutely essential here in the sense that uh, this effective dispersion is the result of reflections. So if I have a scalar equation, I can't have reflections, right? Sure. So yeah, I'm very interested in this is something I've talked to about in the past, but we haven't really come up with anything, something like this that's a scalar equation, right? Um, uh, okay, so a question now is are shocks actually forming in the simulation? They're just too small, right? Uh, for us to see. Right? And one way to probe that is to try to do this kind of course. So this is uh, again, we're going to flip the velocity halfway through. <laughs> forward. And this time we see very good agreement right, between the uh, initial data and final data. Obviously, the velocity is the opposite sign. Right? And you can do a, a convergence study, right? And, and uh, 
small as you like, it seems that these solutions are uh, regular right, for all time as far as we can tell. So this is only a computational exploration of that. And one of the questions I've been really interested in, but have no idea how to tackle, is can we prove right, that these solutions are actually regular for all time? Yeah. Because this is completely contrary to uh, what we typically see for uh, non-pair first order systems. Right, David, for this ratio yeah. of uh, this particular this, uh, this ratio of the dependencies, you have uh, this. Uh, Coherent structure arises compared to the previous case. Yeah. So is four equal to infinity? Oh, what happens if, it, if we make it bigger? Yeah. So the if we if we make the means contrast bigger than this, we see similar behavior. Yes, we'll always see um, solitary wave formation. Right. So in that sense, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And the question is then, I think, where's the transition? Right? Where do we go from having shocks to not having shocks? Can we characterize this in some way? Okay, and this we have done, right? Uh, I would say we did this uh, more as physicists than mathematicians, and I'll tell you what that means, right? Because um, maybe some, something can be added. Uh, oh, before I do that, here's just uh, a collision of two of these static problems, right? So I'm showing you both the strain and the stress here, like, uh, and they behave, you know, very much like solid bond, solid solutions of. Yeah. Systems, right? Um, they they seem to interact through just a phase shift. Okay, but coming back to this question, right? Some initial data or some material parameters, you could say, it depends on both of these, uh, lead to shock waves, and some lead to solitary waves. Uh, you know, can we predict when we get one? Uh, and obviously, there's going to be a, a smooth transition somehow between these two things, right? Uh, or at least a continuous, let's say, transition between these two things. Okay, so for this, uh, it's helpful to go back to the theory of first order hyperbolic systems, um, if you're not familiar with it. So there's a condition that tells you whether a discontinuity um, is truly a stable shock in the presence of a you know, small viscous rate, right? So whether it should be about. Uh, and this is known as an entropy condition uh, because it tells you about the, the sign of the rate of change. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we have the, the sound speed for the system. So this is the derivative of sigma with respect to epsilon, right? And then this S is the speed of a shock, rate, right? Uh, and you can see that it's sort of analogous to the sound speed. But here the brackets mean the jump in that quantity from the left to the right side of the shock. Okay. Right, so this is the Stress on the right minus stress on the left, and this is strain on the right minus strain on the left of the shock. Okay, and a shock uh, is you know valid or entropy satisfying or admissible if it satisfies this condition. Where this is the characteristic speed to the left, sound speed to the left, sound speed to the right, and this is the shock speed. This means that um, in the XT plane, the characteristics from both sides have to be flowing into the shock rate. Uh, otherwise, if they're flowing away from it, then it ought to be different. And the reason that I go back to this is that the condition we, we found um, through experiment and conjecture, really, right, uh, is analogous to this. Right? We can think of this as sort of an effective entropy condition for periodic for shock waves and periodic media. Um, so we can define, oh, we already did, right, an effective sound speed. Well, now in the nonlinear case, so we have the derivative of the stress with respect to strain that evaluated using. The harmonic average of k and then dividing by the arithmetic average of the same averages that you can use in the back of the beginning. And we can do the same thing for the, the shock speed you know, with a sort of effective shock speed. Um, and yeah, so, so this is the lax entropy condition. Fortunately, place it here. Right? Uh, my first guess was something like this. Uh, well, this is probably guess number five or six, but you know, this is still before the last one. Um, but somehow, you know, we should have this entropy condition for these effective speeds. Uh, it turns out that it's sort of a more stringent condition. In fact, the shock has to be overtaking even the fastest moving um, characteristic you know, the rate of propagation. If you remember, this speed is the you know, unreflected signal velocity. 
Um, so any shock that is too weak to move this quickly, right, will uh, not persist as a macroscopic shock. Uh, and uh, anything you know that is this big will will form a shock. So uh, we did a lot of computational experiments to verify this, right, and also to come to this. Right? So what this is showing. We did hundreds of simulations where we start with something that is not discontinuous, but you know, like a hyperbolic tangent function, right? Close to a step function, but not quite, right? With some given left and right step. And we see, uh, does it form a shock? And one way to test that is by looking at the entropy change over time, right? So we normalized it so that uh, one means there was no change in entropy over the simulation. Uh, and down here we have the ratio of these two things, the shock speed and this characteristic speed. And the, the theory on the previous side, slide said that if this is greater than this, so this parameter is bigger than one, then we'll have shock formation. And if it's not, then we won't. Uh, and that's essentially what we see, right? If you zoom in here, right, it's a little bit ambiguous, right? At the, at the interface between these two things. Um, and there's you know, uh, let's see, the color in here uh, uh, has to do with another variable that we change. So there's like five different parameters here that we vary in, right? Um, we're dragging you all down on this one. It seems to be very well. Is the decrease in entropy always a sign of shock or can you do something? Uh, it's always the sign of a shock, right? So you can prove that if you have a strong solution of the PDE, then the entropy is constant. Mm -hmm. But of course, numerically, right? I mean, there are questions here about the numerics too, right? But these are, uh, let's say, way over resolved. Okay. Um, because obviously, if you if you don't have enough numerical resolution, then you see you can and you just see numerical. Well, you know, you have some visualization, or you just found interview. Yeah, so we're using numerical methods that are designed to capture the, the, the vanishing viscosity. So, so that, that built in. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to read the picture in the line of the sun. Uh, trying to follow the dots. Yeah, it doesn't look very regular at all. So there's a lot of, like I said, I mean, this is actually like a five or six dimensional space. I don't remember, you know, projected okay. down to one. Right? So the amount of entropy decay definitely doesn't just depend on this parameter, but whether there's shock formation or not seems to depend just on that. On this point, right? Like we don't expect all these points to line up because well, so you we're not saying this, that the, the strength of the shock, right? Um, it is only governed by this. Yeah, right? so, so in fact, you can show that it's not. You're very different. We, we definitely expect to have spread. Yeah, okay, so like I said, I think we've settled this question in the sense that physicists would settle it. I don't know that it's settled in the sense that not competition would settle it. Right? Uh, there's, not, there's not a theorem. Uh, there's a lot of data. And, so there's still something interesting to do there. But uh, essentially, what we have for solutions uh, looks like this, right? Um, yeah, so, so small amplitude solutions will behave linearly, right? But because of this impedance contrast, they're dispersed. Um, very large amplitude solutions, or when there's no impedance contrast, will generate shock waves always, right? And somewhere in between, when there's a balance between the amplitude of the initial data and the impedance contrast, you get these solid. And another interesting point is that these shock waves will dissipate energy over time, right? And can evolve into this regime, although they'll leave a lot of incoherent junk around uh, And as you usually see, you know, even when we get solitary waves, we'll also have a Just, yeah. uh, it looks like you always gave uh, rotating data. Uh, yeah, so in fact, these simulations are all with basically starting with, like I said, like a tench, right? Is that what you mean? Well, if I look at, I mean, your solitary, it's a data is the chain. Pictures you're showing. The, the pictures that I'm showing here, yeah, yeah. So, 
is there is there is there a way to to read sort of the left state is not the same as the right in these spheres? Yes. Uh, and, and what you'll get, right, if you're in this regime, right, is like a dispersion shock wave that sheds solitons, eventually like solitary waves, eventually, right? And if you're in this regime, you'll get shock wave, but also a lot of oscillations. And, and essentially, that's what's happening here, right? So over here, these are dispersive shock waves that they look like, them, right? Even though we're solving the non right? And here we have actual. Okay, uh, so I have used specific examples to get the point across, but uh, this generalizes in all kinds of directions, right? So uh, if you have a first order nonlinear hyperbolic PDP and you have periodically varying coefficients, then you see this kind of behavior as a general idea, right? So the medium doesn't have to be two size constant, it can be smoothly varying, you can have you know, quadratic, whatever nonlinearities you want, right? Uh, and also higher dimensions, which is what I'll spend most of the rest of the talk. But let me just show you really fast. Uh, here, the, the density and the bulk modulus vary uh, sinusoidally over each period, and you get, again, the train of solitary waves, right? Here's a close up of one of them. Uh, they actually seem to have. Asks here, which I haven't understood yet. I haven't really looked into this. This is a, a lot of this stuff is unknown. Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So you can um, you can carry out that homogenization to whatever order you want, right? And actually, in Gerald Gong's thesis, where you can carry it out to like 50, right? You get these horrendous looking equations. Um, but then you can look for traveling based solutions of, of those, right? So it's very difficult, or I don't know how to look for directly for traveling based solutions of the variable coefficient, right? Or, well, uh, spatially modulated traveling based solutions. But once you homogenize, right, then you can use just the, the usual techniques um, and you know, the, the traveling rate ensembles and then solve the OEDs, right? And you can get uh, periodic or quasi periodic solutions. Yeah, another interesting observation that was made uh, by these guys uh, is, well, at the lowest order, you get this first order hyperbolic system with the average coefficients. That system, of course, has two mean variants. Here they are, right? And what actually happens when you solve the first order hyperbolic system is, well, you know, if you start with a, a hump in the middle, you get two wave trains here, right? One going to the left, one going to the right. Each of them will have all the states uh, in that wave train, right, approximately having a constant value, the same value of one of the Riemann variants, right? So we do for one of them. And one. So uh, it sort of sorts itself out, right, into this homogenized uh, Riemann variant data. Uh, again, this is something that's been sort of you know, observed and not proved for, you know, speculative. Uh, another thing that I stumbled across back when I was doing my, my PhD, um, if you, yeah, so if you assume that one of those Riemann variants is constant and you substitute that into the homogenized equations, right, and you choose the right parameters for your medium, then uh, you can actually get this equation out, right, which is the K2 the Kapton equation that you saw this before. It has these uh, compactness. So, uh, I haven't looked more into this. You know, maybe there are other interesting connections to existing this person not on the game. Okay, so let me go on to more dimensions. So, what's this? We're looking at now a medium with this checkerboard structure. So this inset is just to show you the structure of the medium. It's this nonlinear wave equation, right? I've written it here in second order form, right? um, but it's it's really the same, um, just a two-dimensional version of the, the same equation that I've been uh, talking to you about. So it has this checkerboard structure where rho and uh, and the dependence of, of sigma are piecewise constant, you know, with each of these squares. Um, and you can see there's 200 periods in each direction. And we start with just a Gaussian hump. 
Uh, and I'm just showing you one quadrant we use the trick of reflecting boundary conditions from here. We use the Boston computation. Uh, and of course, if we just solved, if, if this was a homogeneous medium, we would just get this expanding shock, right? But instead, we get a train of basically cylindrical solids right here. Uh, and then this discursive limit. Okay. Oh, yeah. So there's a little story behind this, the, the, the next thing. So Manuel is doing this work, and I said, okay, now set it so that the impedance is the same in both the blue and the yellow squares, right? So the impedance is the same everywhere. And now we'll just see the expanding shock, right? But make it so that it's set, don't make the medium homogeneous, right? Let the sound speeds be different in the, in the kinds of materials. Right. And we still saw solitary information. And we thought, okay, we made a mistake, right? Somehow we're doing this wrong. And, and I had to go back 10 times, right? And, and try to fix it. And finally, we realized that actually there was another mechanism at play here that we didn't know about. Okay. Um, so, in fact, uh, this is just showing linear uh, solutions of a linear wave equation in a medium that has this structure, right? So now instead of having squares, it just has these horizontal layers. Okay, if it's homogeneous, you get something like this, right? Just this initial pulse moving up. Um, if it has different impedances in the two layers, then along this direction, right, you get dispersion because of the reflections. Along this direction, you don't because you're just, you know, it, it doesn't really see the heterogeneity medium. Now, in this quadrant, okay, the, the two uh, materials have the same impedance, so there's no reflection. And here you see, right, just Pulse moving along straightforwardly, but they have different sound speeds. And here you see the spur. So it's a different dispersive mechanism, uh, and I'll talk about it a little more. In this quadrant, we have mismatches in both. You can see the sound speed, we get dispersion in every direction. And of course, you can, you can tune how much dispersion you have along each direction by changing the Okay, but I'm really interested in the nonlinear setting, so let's talk about water waves. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to pick a dispersive water wave model, of course. I'm going to use the shallow water model, so um, there's, there's no dispersion here. But I do have um, this you know, variable height bottom, right? That these terms. Okay. And I'm going to consider this scenario analogous to what I was just telling you. Right? So I've got a plane wave traveling in a direction given by the arrow. But the bottom has these alternating channels and elevated sort of ridges, right? Um, the top down view looks like this. So the waves are moving along this way, and you've got these ridges and channels. And of course, the characteristic speed for this system is u plus or minus square root of h. So we have h here coming into the picture. So the, in the deeper water, the waves want to move faster, right? Uh, and in the shallower water, Waves want to move slow. So we have this initially planar front. Of course, part of it wants to get ahead, part of it wants to fall behind. And as soon as that starts to happen, though, then you have uh, transverse you know, propagation in, in the y direction. Okay? Um, I, I call it diffraction. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit of an abuse of the, of the word diffraction, maybe. Um, and we've referred to this as bathymetric dispersion. Uh, so actually, if you go back to that paper of Santosa and Sines, um, this kind of dispersion was actually already there for linear waves, of course. Okay? Uh, they didn't, I'm not even sure that they realized, right, that just having the sound speeds different from the dispersion, but it's, it's there in the results. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is what happens if you actually uh, uh, simulate this, right? So this is uh, um, the, the periodic boundary conditions in Y, right? And notice the, the domain here is just one unit wide, right? So um, this is you know, replicated infinitely in the y direction, and it's very long in this direction. I'm showing you after the waves have traveled, you know, 800 units in the width of the of the domain. And what we have here are trained solitary waves. It's easier to see if you look at you know, the trace along here and the trace along here, which are what these red and blue plots are. So you can see that the amplitude of the waves is different. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't say. The, the top half of the channel is shallow and the bottom half is deep, right? And there's this discontinuity in the bottom type along the bottom line. Okay, and the initial hump again will resolve itself into these kinds of travel loops. And these are actual travel loops now, right? Because the medium 
uh, doesn't vary in the direction of travel. Okay, they have almost a hyperbolic sequence spread of shape. This is what we get if you take them all and rescale them in the usual way with the E solid ones, right? The amplitude of the wave flight for its sort of amplitude. Um, this is what the profile of each of those solitary waves looks like in the y direction, in the oscillating direction. Okay. Um, and they seem to have a nonlinear speed and amplitude relationship. Um, we look at collisions between them in an overtaking collision. As far as we can tell, it's elastic, and somehow in an elon collision, we got radiation. Um, yeah, but actually, we realized afterward if you just take one period of this, it's the same as flowing a channel with a, you know, with a bottom that looks like this, if you assume slip conditions of the boundaries. So these have exactly the same solution because of the symmetry of this periodic bottom and, and uh, plane wave energy. Um, so then we went back and looked, and indeed there's work on uh, flow in the channel that doesn't relate to this. Um, and you can derive uh, a KDV level equation using homogenize. Um, but there should be more terms here, right? This we just truncated it at the lowest order of this interest. Yeah, so so now we've averaged in Y. So that's the homogenous section. So the so this is an equation for the average depth where it's average in plus. Uh, okay. There's more to say, but I don't have Oh, yeah, we, we've looked at other shapes of, of channels, right? It doesn't have to be this sort of step function. Again, um, there's a V shaped channel. Again, uh, so, and again, these are waterways. This is a non dispersive waterway model, right? So uh, there's no dispersion. So then, of course, you can ask, um, you know, how does this? Compete with or relate to the dispersion that is in other water wave models. Because right? if you actually uh, set up an experiment, we have both sources of dispersion present. Right? Um, and what we found is that uh, there are regimes where uh, waves will break very, very rapidly and, and very strongly um, in, over a flat bottom. But with this variation of symmetry, they never break in the same solid. So this is actually a simulation, a 3D simulation of you know, heat fluid and aviate stokes. So three boundary here between the air and the water, and we're even including the friction of the walls and surface tension. Right? Obviously, you don't get the, the very neat uh, training solitary waves. This is a more interesting three-dimensional structure, but the waves are uh, And this is the analogous simulation um, over a flat model. And whether you choose, you know, the deep part of the, the channel as your depth, the shallow part, or something in between, uh, you get strong breaking of the base for the ancient dimension. Uh, oh, yeah. And yeah, I guess I'm all right. So I wanted to show one last thing. Uh, this is just something that uh, I did a long time ago. You know, you don't have to have these variable coefficients baked into the PPE. They can actually be, you know, part of your nonlinear system. Okay, so here I have um, the Euler equations. What, what you know, in my world we call Euler equations, which is compressible gas Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so mass, momentum, and energy conservation. In the PPE, right. This is a first order hyperbolic system. Right? Generically, you get formation of shock waves. But I'm choosing some very special initial data here. My density varies sinusoidally. Right? Uh, the velocity is zero, and the pressure is constant here. And then there's this you know, Gaussian humping pressure. And I'm just using that initially uh, reflecting down. So it's like this whole hump here. Two way trains that we just see one way. Right. And then the, the Camera is going to move along with the pulse, right? Uh, don't look at the bottom simulation. I think you might have a seizure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but you can see this initial pulse, right, breaks up again into a train solid. Uh, 
Uh, so again, what's different here, right, is that we don't have any explicit spatial dependence of the, of the coefficients in the PDE. Uh, instead, it's just the initial data. It's still built into this. Our, our medium is the Uh, okay, so the main message, right, is just that if you have a periodic variation of coefficients or you know, something like it, you saw the last slide, um, it will induce an effective dispersion, right, even in these first systems. This can cause solutions to behave similarly to those in higher order dispersion complicated equations, and this can arise in lots of physical applications. Although, of course, this perfect periodicity is a bit idealized, right? So setting up experiments can be challenging. Um, yeah, here are some, uh, you know, particular points of interest. I mean, you guys probably have a, have a better idea of this than I do, but I try to, from the perspective of people working in this field, what's interesting here, one thing is that you can tune the dispersion, right? So, for instance, if you wanted to do you know, experiments with these water waves, you could uh, tune the dispersion to be exactly what you wanted, which you can't do with uh, dispersion you normally present in, in water waves. Um, of course, uh, you can take the homogenized equations from one of these systems, right? This constant coefficient these, and analyze them using all the tools that you do guys have at disposal. On the other hand, direct analysis of the variable coefficient first order systems, right? I think for the most part, you know, remains open. Um, so things like existence of solutions that are available at all time, right? Looking at stability and even the really existence of these. Um, traveling wave solutions. Right? Uh, it, it's just complicated by that spatial, spatial variation. Um, and there's, you know, all, all the questions that people are asking about dispersive wave equations, you could ask them about this. Right? So, solid wave interactions, solid wave gases, periodic uh, wave problem waves, et cetera. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to say I haven't said very much about uh, the history and work in this area, and there is, I would say, a bit scattered um, that, that work out, right? So, some of the fundamental references, these first two, right, that I, that I mentioned a bit about, um, but then um, one that's actually, you know, from this community, right? So, Karina uh, Cruz and Nova at Loughborough has worked on um, things in this vein, um, solid waves and wave and get solids. Uh, there's also a group at Tallinn University in Estonia um, that's been working on this, mostly for elasticity and layer media. Um, there's some papers of the Ben Gonzalez, both gas dynamics and water waves that are uh, similar to what I've been talking about here. Um, and in the linear setting, um, the Ockendens and the Stronger at Oxford have done some work on these linear dispersion effects. And then here are some of the references to Homer. You can find a lot on the site. Um, mostly with. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Is it just spatially periodic or can temporal periodic also? Yeah, somebody else asked this the other day. Uh, so I think if you only have temporal periodicity, then you won't prevent the shock formation, right? Because you, you don't have inflection, right? Okay, so I'm just thinking in one view, right? Right? So the solution will be steepening at all times, right? It might be steepening more slowly and sometimes in faster other times. But I think it, I haven't done any analysis or work in that area, but I don't my intuition is that we were just in shock time. Yeah, so here, right, like this way, it's traveling through this medium, right, with these red and blue uh, layers. 
So there's constantly reflections going on, but it's yeah. Uh, if if the layers were really wide, right, then we would see a wave moving and we'd see a, a, a transmitter and reflect the wave. And instead, we have this superposition of hundreds of waves. So there is a, a little bit of it, right? But it's vanishing in small numbers. I have a, just a curiosity. So you, you consider the case where you have two media and they all turn into three. So is there anything in the case where you have, say, three or more media alternating? Yeah, you'll, you'll get similar behavior. I mean, the limit of that would be just a, a continuous, or one of that would be a continuous in the right medium. I'm not sure if one point like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but any, any periodic variation uh, will give you this kind of behavior. It doesn't matter, you know, whether it's piecewise constant at all, or piecewise constant with several values in one period. You can describe that case the, uh, the system as a dispersive system, a purely dispersive system. You're thinking that if you have more media, uh, the system is purely dispersive. What, what do you mean by purely so dispersive? So you show this uh, approximation as a uh, um, uh, you show that you can replace the equation by a dispersive yeah. equation with some computation. Of course, the that, that's valid, right? As long as the solutions remain smooth. When we get shocks, right, then that model no. doesn't work very well. So, okay, the so we, if you. Oh, can we still carry out the whole yeah. yeah, of mm -hmm. course. So, uh, Like I said, the, the coefficients of the homogenized PDE are some in one D just simple averages, right? Over one period. So it doesn't matter what the structure is, right? You, you just have it. Uh, and in multi dimensions, you have to solve elliptic you know, boundary body problems to get those coefficients. So you can have whatever periodic structure you want. So it's a general. Now, if you ask if it's not perfectly periodic, right? You have maybe like slight differences in the widths of the layers or slight differences in the values, right? That's something I haven't published anything, but we did some experiments, right? And as soon as you go away from this perfect creativity, you don't get a nice solid right? You still get like more of a tendency toward dispersion and less of a tendency towards shocks, but it's just much faster. So random. So it just you will see this sort of structure. You don't get any solitary waves. But one thing that does hold. This thing, um, this condition, right? Holds um, really high probability in intermediate intensity, right? I mean, you, you'll still see. So, so if you, instead of a random medium, or instead of a random medium, have a random medium, right? Then you'll still get this picture, right? Where this critical value governs whether you're the problem. Uh, you know, macroscopic shocks in the shape. Yeah. In the regime where you don't get solitary waves, you get the entropy shocks. Do, do they get, can you describe them effectively? Looks like an end game. So, yeah, so, kind of like that. Well, the, there's this intermediate regime where I think it's really, I think it's very messy, right? Here, you know. Uh, Obviously, you're not going to have like a really simple, I don't know, right? But yeah, yeah, right. And, and yeah, I mean, the idea here is that you have the water wave case where they're moving, you know, parallel to these ridges and troughs, it's actually much nicer. And we have some experiments that we can the paper showing that, you know, you get something that looks like an end wave, but it has these oscillations and goes on. So, uh, yeah, we haven't tried to make that rigorous or complicated. Because it does seem like that's the, the, the transition, right? Really going from circuit to circuit, effectively. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? All right, let's thank you.